How is everyone doing? Good? Yeah? Cool, cool, cool. So setting a timer so that I control. All right. Hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. First bar camp for me. Uh, I've been hearing about bar camps for a very long time. I attended many on conferences, but never had the chance to come to the one in Lisbon. So today I want to share with you basically what is IPFS, the interplanetary file system, talk a little bit about the distributed web, and some bonus stuff in 10 minutes. This is very ambitious. I might speak too fast. Tell me to slow down if I'm speaking too fast. Uh, also, disclaimer, I just like jumped off from a Capoeira festival. And so 30 minutes ago, I was like jumping and spinning and singing. And now I'm here and like talking to you all. So like my body is all confused. Uh, it feels like, I don't know, like a, if you know, like a control plane crash where you know, don't worry, like everyone is going to, to be alive at the end, but might be a little bit happy. So hectic. Uh, cool. So let's get started. Who is familiar with IPFS? Quick show of hands. OK, a few people in the room. All right. Who feels that they understand what content addressing is? Perhaps that they used it before. No hands. Awesome. Uh, perhaps this is even a better one. Who feels that they understand process addressing? All right. This is going to be good. Uh, who has heard about CRTTs, conflict-free replicate data types? OK, I see some hands. Who has heard about DAPs, so distributed applications? Also a few hands. Good. Like this, lots of, lots of exciting things. Who has heard about serverless? Lots of hands. OK, let's forget about that. Like, <laughs> uh, like whoever, like, I don't know what happened there, calling serverless a thing with servers doesn't really work uh, in the same way that we think about the distributed computing, distributed platforms. So um, just uh, setting a quick frame of mind for everyone, like let's talk about the web. The platform that we use that we develop our apps on, uh, like we we all know these icons. Uh, we probably use them every day, or most of them every day. But this web, this platform that we love, that we learn to rely on, that we use to communicate with our loved ones, it's kind of like fragile. Like if you lose the connectivity to the backbone, boom! Like all of these apps, like just stop working, right? Like you might be working on a uh, office application, like a Google Doc. You are typing, the Wi-Fi goes off, and like it just shuts you out. And the reason why this happened is actually like a very simple reason, almost silly, but that it was a technical design decision that was made at a time where the internet was very different. And that is location addressing. Uh, you might be familiar with the idea that like you always that you put a, a name on a browser, um, you are actually translating that name to an IP address. And that IP address is the IP of the machine, or at least the gateway to a, then a, a big set of machines that has the resource that you're looking for. And so what that means is like, if one of those machines in your path to, to get to the resource you want goes down, like one of those nodes, suddenly all of those applications are gone. It, and it's kind of silly, because you might be looking for a document that is on someone else's machine, but because you cannot access the central point of authority, it, it doesn't work. Uh, even worse, right? Like, you might have the file in your machine already. You might like reading a news article, and, um, and like you go into a plane, suddenly you're offline, and now you click refresh on the web page, and it's gone again. Like the, the browser just, just shuts down. Uh, so this is a big problem. Other problem is the fact that we keep like sending the same bits over and over again over the wire. Like if we all see a YouTube video here, we are going to download it over and over again, and that's like very wasteful. There's more problems with internet. It doesn't work on this kind of scenarios. Control, like we have seen countries like shutting out internet for their citizens. There's problems with security. The fact that it's like the web is being shut off from IoT and, and many other things. And so IPFS, the interplanetary file system, comes to solve those problems, comes to upgrade the web. So this doesn't mean that this is a new web. It's like to upgrade what we have and make it, give it superpowers, new superpowers. It make it work offline, distributed, permanent, safer, and especially faster. And it does this by like removing the location addressing part to uh, content addressing. And content addressing here means instead of like referencing the thing by location, you reference the thing by the, its cryptographic ID, like the hash function. Is everyone familiar with hash functions? Use, okay, lots of hands, cool. So you know that these IDs are unique, and so if I'm looking for a piece of content, I can ask you for the ID, you can give me the content, and I can validate it myself that I have received it. And in IPFS, uh, it's even better. It even gets better, because actually a file, it's not just like an array of bytes. 
uh, it actually gets transformed into a direct acyclic graph, a DAC for short. Uh, and this graph means that instead of like having this like imagine terabyte file in one single blob, I can like synchronize it uh, in little pieces. So if I'm downloading one terabyte file, instead of trying to download it from one machine, like, an, like when you load, like when you fetch a YouTube video, instead of like fetching from just one single endpoint, you can actually fetch from multiple peers, wherever they are. If they are in this room, they are in this room. If they are in the next building, they are in the next building. But just like makes the whole overall experience super, super fast. And you might be familiar with this concept. It's not a new thing. Like maybe the, the first thing you heard about was like Merkle trees. Um, so the idea to synchronize like sets of public keys, uh, this was a published pub paper published on 1980. Uh, and then other systems picked up on this idea and things that you probably use every day, like Git uh, is a Merkle tree, like uses these, these properties, these hash links. Um, Bitcoin is also a Merkle tree, like the blockchain is a hash link data structure. And other systems actually like are Merkle trees as well, like they use these stacks. By the way, uh, have you heard the saying, money doesn't grow on trees? Okay, I see some hands nodding. They didn't expect Bitcoin to come up. But, um, and IPFS is kind of like this Merkle forest. Like it's where all of these DAGs, all of these Ashland data structures can live, can be transferred, can be fetched, can be found, etc. IPFS is a protocol. Uh, we have parts of the implementation in multiple languages, but like we have too many very robust ones in Go and JS. Any fans of Go? Any fans of JS? Oh yeah, like a lot of people. Cool. And so with IPFS, my time is running so quick. Um, with IPFS, you can build these things called the DAPs, the distributed applications. And we, the real idea of like a distributed application is that first it doesn't require a central point of authority for you to interact with it. Uh, clients, in this case, we start calling them peers, um, can still interact with the application, with the software, even if they are disconnected from some central party. Um, and, and servers can still exist. We are not saying, oh, let's ban the servers, let's ban the cloud. Like, servers can still exist to provide a better and improved quality of service uh, for things like persistence, low times, etc. cetera. And, and, and you, again, might be very familiar with this experience. Like, let's talk about Git. Git, uh, after many uh, iterations on control, um, version control systems, Git appeared, um, and what Git offered was, okay, let's make every node in the network like speak the same protocol. And what that means is, if there is some disconnectivity, you can still exchange through email, through a USB drive, through airdrop, whatever, you can still transmit those, uh, those patches, and you can still work on a Git project without being connected to the central service. So uh, if, if the, the thing in the, the central goes down, like all the other peers can still work. And so it, we are kind of like used to Git through GitHub, and like sometimes we suffer from GitHub going down, but the reality is like you can still continue working. You can just like set up a new remote server or a new remote endpoint and the thing still works. It's really powerful. However, yes, like you need to set up these things. This, this is kind of like a manual process for Git, and that's why people just like go out of the office and go, I don't know, have a beer outside when GitHub goes down because it's, it's annoying. And, and, but IPFS basically solves that problem. and just says like if it exists on your neighbor's machine or on the other side of the world, we can just work over it. Um, so what, is a, like, what does a distributed application look like? Uh, and I wanted to give PeerPad as a demo. PeerPad is kind of like Google Docs without Google. Um, it's an application that like, lets you create a document, share a URL, and then from then on, like, those two people are communicating directly and uh, exchanging the changes that they're doing on the document without any central coordination to help them coalesce the changes. This is thanks to uh, two very powerful uh, concepts that, again, came from CS. One is the conflict-free replicated data types. Uh, there's like a type of types missing there. And, and essentially what, are you familiar with operational transforms? Does that ring a bell? No? Okay, so operational transforms is what Google Docs uses. So you have a central provider that like accepts all the changes and then creates the latest state and then like, sends the latest state to all the, the machines. A CRDT is basically a contract. Like I agree with my other peers that I'm going to merge the changes in this, like a specific way. And so without me interacting with the other peers, just like receiving the changes, and again, the changes can come from a USB drive, uh, some other peer that doesn't even participate in the conversation, um, I can ensure 
that the state that I will see in my machine, like the final state, will be the same as others see on their machine. So this is very powerful. Like you can basically figure out what is the latest state of a variable, of a document, of an array, whatever, um, uh, without interacting with any central service and without interacting with the other peers on the network. And, and this is what happens in PeerPad. So we keep emitting changes, broadcasting, sending, uh, sending things that we are changing, and we know that like, when we look at the document, like we, we have the same state. The other thing, um, the other thing, I'm, I know I'm meeting on QA, but I, I'll be super quick. The other thing I really want to plant the seed on your uh, brains right now is cryptographic ACLs. And, and it's kind of like a new concept, but, but again, one very powerful. When PeerPad, when you sh exchange the URL, there's like a lot of stuff that goes on the URL bar. And all of those characters are essentially two keys, one symmetric key and one uh, private key, and also a public key. Shut up. Um, sorry. Um, so keys, I have four minutes for QA. Can I do one more? OK, thank you. Uh, so key, three keys, symmetric, private, public. And what peers use these keys for is to get uh, first, like encryption. So like they use a symmetric key, a key to encrypt all the data. And this is kind of like a read permission. If you have the symmetric key, you can decrypt it. You can see what, what is the content. Then they exchange the, the private key to give it a way for other peers to have authorship. So if you have the private key, you can sign the changes on the document. And when I receive those changes, I can verify that it's part of a peer that I gave permission to sign these changes, and therefore I will consume these changes. Um, and it has like this shared log amongst peers to see like who has access, who, who has revoked access, and 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 I can understand like what are the peers who have the authority to grant access to others. So this really plays well with the CRDT idea, right? Like you have all these changes appearing and you have like this co coalescing function. Uh, and like if, if the signature checks out, you accept. Again, like you're validating that the peer has write permission. Um, if the thing gets like is, comes in plain text or comes encrypted with another key, it means that it's not part of that room. So you, don't, you cannot read it. Super cool. I'll I look forward for your uh, questions. Uh, and so this is like just simple thing that you can do, like a collaborative document without Google. Uh, there are other things that people are doing, kind of like the we transfer without, again, the central server, foundation.io. There are people building like a YouTube competitor entirely decentralized using the Steemit blockchain and IPFS. And Steemit is kind of like a reputation blockchain, which kind of like plays very well with the talk from before. Uh, there's like people building like IRC slash Slack apps. And also there are people putting like virtual reality worlds into IPFS because it happens that like virtual reality or mixed reality takes a lot of space, takes a lot of data. So like moving those blobs over the wire is kind of expensive. And if you have a protocol that helps you like just stream the things really, really fast, then it makes the experience even on a phone. And, and here the example is someone with a HoloLens loading like paintings to their wall and like loading like, for example, a bone to their coffee table that they got from an archive, an internet archive. It's also used to store and archive data from a lot of places in the world. A lot of companies use it. There's a lot of files going through the network. It's totally open source, MIT license. Like everyone can participate in our research discussions, development, etc. Even our sprints. You can like, hang out with us on the uh, sprint calls. It's a very large open source project. Over 2,000 contributors, 150 people like, come weekly to our channels. And that is what I had to share with you in under. 14 minutes. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>